So what happens when a psychedelic encounter with magic mushrooms becomes the gateway to a lifelong passion for fungi? In this episode, we'll unravel the threads of Scott Astuni's personal journey from the kaleidoscopic visions that sparked his curiosity to the profound connection he discovered with nature. He will share the intimate details of his mycological awakening. But this isn't just a tale of magic and mushrooms. It's a celebration of the interconnectedness of life. As we venture into the heart of the mycological rabbit hole, be prepared to be captivated by the stories of personal growth, an expansion of knowledge, and a true entry into scientific contributions. Whether you're a seasoned mycophile or just starting to dip your toes into the world of mushrooms, this episode promises to be a delightful adventure into the intersection of consciousness and the fungal kingdom. So fasten your seatbelts and open your minds as we explore the transformative power of fungi guided by the passion and insights of Scott Astuni. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator advocate and educator every week he sits down with fellow cultivators mushroom educators scientists and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives all right guys what's up welcome to the Michael geeky podcast the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game i am your host Michael geeky and we got a great show for you tonight uh we you know we sit down and talk a lot with uh cube cultivators right uh, a lot of people growing a lot of cubes um this is an interesting story this is a story of somebody whose beginnings are very similar to a lot of my guests but his path went a slightly different way uh, a little bit of chance, a little bit of uh, serendipity, whatever you want to call it. Um, but he has now found himself in the position of doing some pretty amazing things uh, as an amateur mycologist. Uh, I'm talking about Scott Astuni. He is, uh, you know, he works with uh, Fundus. He uh, is working with Kyle Cannon, uh, one of my buddies here in Ohio, who's doing a lot of great things with uh, the nanopore uh, uh, machine that's that's allowed uh, just just a bigger entry into uh, fungal barcoding. It's allowing us to do these diversity surveys. Uh, you know, Stephen Russell got got this going. Uh, Scott's running with it. Uh, Kyle's running with it. And, uh, you know, like Alan Rockefeller's on this, a couple other buddies, uh, I got here locally are working on it. It's just really cool to see how, how you can just go from zero to hero, man. You can go from doing nothing, watching your Netflix every night to doing something, contributing, you know, uh, uh, being a part of something that is deepening people's appreciation of fungi uh, deepening people's uh, enthusiasm for mushrooms. Uh, yeah, every time I see somebody, uh, you know, say that they're going to send uh, Kyle Cannon a, b a bunch of mushrooms, I think, man, I know how that feels. It feels really cool to be on your INET and start getting these barcodes back, either confirming or not confirming your your initial uh, identification of the mushrooms you found. It just gets you a little bit deeper into it. Um, and definitely is putting a little bit of science in the hand of uh, hands of amateurs. Um, I think Scott is a shining example of kind of going from the I'm just a guy to I'm a guy who's actually trying to do something meaningful here. And uh, it, it's it, it, it's pretty great. I hope I, I hope at least five of you guys listening tonight, two, three, four, five years from now are just somewhere you never thought you would be with mushrooms. Um, uh, just deepening that, that relationship. So anyway, that, that I had been talking to him about coming on for quite a while, I'm finally making it happen. I got a long list, man. I got a list and you know, it just works out when it works out. So, so tonight's the night. Um, anyway, before I do that, let's go ahead and, uh, Got got to give credit where credit is due. My Patreon supporters are are growing. I really appreciate the momentum. I appreciate the support. I think a lot of people are realizing like I could just do a five dollar a month. Um, it 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 does help. Trust me. If if I had one percent of my viewers uh, donating five dollars a month, I would be 
the content would, would definitely be evolving. I can tell you that. Um, so we'll get there. It's all good. We're, you know, slowly, but surely I'm, I'm earning your guys' trust and you guys are coming to appreciate the show. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and just pull that up so everybody can see. Um, if you go on the internet, go to Google, Patreon, the word Patreon, the word Michael Geeky, it, it'll pull up my page. You can go there and, and consider supporting me there. I'd really appreciate it. Um, also, my Discord's doing great. Uh, we had a little hiccup. Again, we've been having a lot of hiccups with these mutants. Uh, <laughs> Not surprising, right? They're they're unpredictable. They're unruly. Um, we have this massive cold front moving in. Uh, it is like an ice blizzard out here uh, in Ohio. It is very cold. It is very windy, and um, it has slightly derailed uh, for for another week. Uh, the the mutant grow along, uh, but Mickey Mayhew is going to be getting out everybody's uh, packs as soon as this radical cold front lifts. And uh, uh, stay tuned. That, that's all in the Discord. Um, it's still happening. It's just, you know, man, by the time we all get our liquid culture, we are going to be so ready to do this. Uh, with the enthusiasm and the, the momentum is going to be crazy. So I really look forward to that. I can't wait to see all these people grown mutants for the first time. Uh, this year is going to be the year of growing something different, whether it's exotics, whether it's wood lovers, whether it's outdoor grows for your first time whether it's just mutants, um, let this be the year that you, uh, take, you know, take a bite out of the other side of the apple. Let's see what else we can grow this year. All right, guys. So without further ado, I think it's time we bring, uh, the, the man of the hour on. I'm talking about Scott Astuni. What's up, man? Not much. How are you doing? I'm living the American dream in my basement one day at a time. That's how I'm doing. Yes. Loving mushrooms, not loving Northeast Ohio in the winter, of course, for, for no mushrooms anymore. I'm not roaming through the woods looking for, you know, the one or two occasional mushrooms that decide to pop out of some trees. I can't do it. I'm waiting until spring. But in the meantime, to get my fix, we're going to talk to people like you and uh, learn a little bit more, get people excited for for the the springtime when all the mushrooms come out to play. So. Here we are. Um, so, and meanwhile, it's actually uh, peak mushroom season here in Florida. <laughs> of course, yeah. Shut up! I don't want to hear anything about that. Yeah, uh, our friend uh, Sarah Culleton just went down there, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, she. You know, that's when you know you're you're officially at the bottom of the rabbit hole of of mycology is when you are traveling to the mushrooms. <laughs> because there aren't enough where you live that's <laughs> that's how you know for sure um so why don't you do this let's start off i do this with everybody um just i it's the first mushroom memory your first you know entree into this world of fungi whether however you got into it and then maybe paint a little bit of a picture of the journey you've gone through your interest how it's evolved over time how long that that span has been just kind of get us up to how it started to to where we are now yeah so uh it's it it's a pretty typical uh start to my mushroom journey um when i was i think 18 years old i was uh on a skate trip in atlanta georgia and uh, one of my buddies, we were at the motel and one of my buddies pulled out a mushroom and I guess his friend had given it to him and he kept it for this trip and he whipped it out and I ended up splitting it with him. And um, at the time I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day and, you know, I didn't have any like expectation. I, I had no preconceived notions about like what psilocybin mushrooms did at all. I didn't know anything, you know, I was drinking 40s, smoking blunts and I was just like, yeah, let's add this to the mix. And, uh, <laughs> um, but at the end of the night I had this experience, um, and it made me question what I was doing, uh, smoking cigarettes so much. And, uh, I, not quite cold turkey, but pretty much cold turkey. Like within like a week, I stopped smoking cigarettes and I didn't touch tobacco for another like five years. Um, I have smoked cigarettes since then. It didn't like make me permanently quit, but for five years, I didn't touch them. Um, 
and so that made me like it, it made me question you know what the hell are mushrooms why did i have this experience on this what i perceived to be a recreational drug and um so over the course of the next like one or two years i experimented with them a couple more times and that question what are mushrooms became more and more prevalent and it got to a point where i started foraging for uh Psilocybe cubensis here in south florida um it also got me into foraging for other things like edible mushrooms like chanterelles uh indigo milk caps and then also like the medicinal stuff like the ganoderma complex we have down here in south florida um and then I started thinking, well, okay, like if, you know, psilocybin does this to my mind, what does, um, I guess this was the thought before I got into foraging edible mushrooms, but it was like, if psilocybin does this to my mind, what does wild foraging like edible and medicinal stuff do to my body? And so I started foraging all the edible plants and mushrooms. And then I started growing my own food as well as, uh, you know, medicinal plants. Um, and then. Wow. So, so, yeah. Let me ask you this, though. So th that, that, that first experience with psilocybin, um, was it like a formal message or was it just like uh, a sort of so afterwards? So I was on the balcony of our motel smoking a cigarette and there was this like big tree uh, like hanging over the motel. And I don't know how to explain it, but um, yeah, th this message kind of popped into my head and it was one size does not fit all. And in the moment I took this to mean it, it was referring to the cigarette I was smoking. So I started thinking about cigarettes and it was like, wow, they all come in like one size and one size doesn't fit all. So like the next day I kind of adopted that. And so I would just smoke the cigarette until I was content. And I found that my point of being content was not after smoking the whole cigarette. It was honestly like a third to halfway through the cigarette. And then I kept doing that for another like three or four days. And I didn't anticipate it, but the the like flavor and feeling of smoking a cigarette just became kind of disgusting. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm kind of done. Uh, Wow. So it kind of weaned me off, like with the whole one size doesn't fit all message. But then it just like very quickly started disgusting me. I wish I could do that with food. I have the opposite problem. <laughs> See, if, if I had a trip and it said one size doesn't fit all, eat as much food as you want, I would probably weigh 800 pounds. So, uh, yes, I'm glad that works for cigarettes. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I've, I've had some friends who have had similar things, various messages, but it's always kind of like a call to action of um, usually relating to your health and how you're treating yourself and your mm -hmm. body. Yeah, I think that, that I, I don't know if I want to say that's a universal theme, but that is a frequently occurring theme for people. It has not been any of my themes. Mine are more about like talking with nature. I'm always like... <laughs> one of my most profound i literally met a tree and it 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 was speaking tree language i was speaking tree <laughs> language and it told me the whole purpose of trees and the meaning of their existence i also by the way i love mushrooms but i have had a long standing love for trees i do bonsai i i build furniture with wood i i i'm very intimately connected with them i'm sure that's why this this happened during the trip mm -hmm. You know, all all was revealed during the trip, and then I I came out of it, and the next day, I, of course, it's not there. That your relationship changes. I, I literally now feel more connected to them, but I, I I don't know what they're saying. They're not talking to me anymore, so it's too bad. But yeah, I I think that's fascinating how we can get some sort of message, and then even afterwards, right? Like for you, that was a form of self-integration therapy you decided 
to do something with that message afterwards, it, it reframed your relationship with that cigarette as you're smoking it, mm -hmm. ultimately leading to you being like, oh, I don't like this. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. It's fascinating. Um, all right. So you, uh, okay. So a uh, fairly yeah. traditional entree into, into mushrooms, at least for the guests on my show. Um, and then, I think your story is very similar to mine. It's like, okay, I love cubes. I, I love growing them, but they're, I also, you know, I like to eat things. I, I've always loved mushrooms and food. And I grew up foraging morels with a couple family members. <clears throat> and so it didn't take long for me to start wandering around the woods now that I'm all into mushrooms and, and wanting to eat as many as I can. And, and that, yeah, I think that's a natural progression. So, okay, so you're foraging, you're finding mushrooms, you're eating mushrooms, you're growing your own food, you're definitely, uh, at least from my perspective, forming a deeper relationship with things you can or do put in your body, plants, all that good stuff. All right, keep going. I want to uh, get me from there to where I know you are now. Right, so another... <sighs> So when I got into like uh, foraging wild mushrooms, uh, I was a little kind of, I guess, neurotic about it. So I was like, okay, I want to make sure I can identify every possible mushroom that I come across in uh, maybe a cow field like habitat. Um, and so I can kind of discern, you know, Psilocybe cubensis, Pinellas cyanescens, which also grows down here from say like chlorophyllum molybdites um which actually doesn't grow out of cow manure but can occur in the same kind of environment and so i did that and then with the edible ones too i wanted to make sure i could discern between um chanterelle mushrooms and say like uh southern jack-o-lantern which is what like umphalotus subaludens or whatever um and then, like you know, the reishi from whatever other polypores that you just didn't want to, you didn't want to die. I didn't want to die. Um, yeah. But yeah. as a consequence of that, I, I learned a lot of other mushrooms that didn't didn't necessarily have uh, edible, medicinal, or psychoactive function. Um, and then, so fast forward to twenty nineteen. Simultaneously, I found albino chanterelles. Um, so we have, Ooh. yeah. So in South Florida, we have these chanterelles called Cantharellus cocolobe, and they're these chanterelles that grow at the beach with sea grape trees. Oh, wow. And um, no way. Yeah, it's really cool. So you can go to the beach and find chanterelles and they grow in these like really fat clusters. Uh, to my knowledge, it's like the only species of cantharellus that grows in like really big clusters. Um, anyway, how, so how big are we talking? Like, like this big? Or are we I mean, are we talking 10 of the woods, 30 pound clusters or what? What are we talking? not not 30 pound clusters? Okay. I mean, uh, shants really don't grow in clusters, generally speaking. So, I mean, almost right. any cluster would be impressive and for me. I would say like 10 to 15 fruit bodies. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, a decent size. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I was finding that, and uh, the common description for Cantharellus cocolobe, as far as, like, the color, is, like, salmon pink. And then you'll also find um, kind of like a orangey variety. But there's this one spot in Jupiter, Florida, where I was finding four different color variants. I was finding like the traditional salmon pink. I was finding an albino variant. I was finding like an orange one and then like a gold colored one. And it was really odd because I had, you know, scoured the sea grapes like throughout all of South Florida. And typically I would only find um, one of these color variants, the like salmon pink sometimes orange one um so i was like okay what's going on here there's like an albino chanterelle and i was also um at that same time me and my buddy found a psilocybe growing on wood chips in like a irrigated mulch bed yep. and okay. we knew it was a psilocybe it was blueing 
my buddy who had experience picking like Salasmi cyanescens in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, he was like, oh, wow, like these aren't them, but they're growing out of wood chips and they're bluing like that's a Salasmi. And I, I was familiar enough with the different species of actives that were known to grow in Florida, specifically South Florida. And I knew it didn't fit any of the criteria for any of these other ones. So I was finding both of those things at the same time, like these two mushrooms that I had questions about the identity of. And so I reached out to Alan Rockefeller and I initially asked him about the chanterelles and I was like, Hey, have you ever seen this maybe on your trips to Mexico? I assume that those chanterelles grow there maybe along the coast, but yeah, I was just trying to reach out to see if anyone had insight into these like albino chanterelles and um he's like oh no but you should get them dna sequenced and he, he never says that scott no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> he wants it all sequenced yes right especially interesting things so i was like okay well how do i do that and he kind of you know helped me out told pointed me in the right direction so i was like you know what fuck these chanterelles uh <laughs> i'm gonna get this psilocybe sequence uh because i'm way more curious about that so i sent it out to alva labs in spain um so it, Why if the heck did you send it to spain dude like, because there's so here right well at the time um, unless you wanted to do like the pcr dna extraction pcr yourself Oh, and then yeah. send the PCR product off for sequencing. You can okay. do that, but I wasn't there yet. So if you send it to Alva Labs, they'll do the whole thing for you, okay. like from okay. DNA extract, you know, to sequencing. Gotcha. Um, and the guy who runs it, Pablo Alvarado, he's amazing at what he does. And he'll, you know, when he sends you the chromatograms, he'll also send you like a short list of like closest. Uh, species oh, cool. based on uh, uh, Gen Bank blast, and so anyway, I, I got it back, and um, there it was like a ninety nine point, let's say, seven or something match to Psilocybe tyruga neomaculans, and then where, that, Psilocy where is that one at? Where is that one even? It, it's in that? Thailand. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and then also in another, one river valley, right? <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I've it was never described. Even heard of that one? Okay. Yeah, it was described from I think Chiang Mai Park in Thailand, and then there another close match was Salasidae Thai or Thai duplicata sustidiata, and so I was like, okay, well, it's a ninety nine point whatever match to that. Does that mean it's the same thing? And so I reported this to Alan. And he, he got really excited because he's like, oh, wow, you know. <laughs> this is his cup of tea right here. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so then, we, you know, we dug into it. And based on, you know, macro morphological features as well as like substrate, it's growing out of, it. it is different. Um, and, you know, now this philosophy, which I'm sure a lot of your audience knows by the provisional name, Psilocybe Nivio Tropicalis. Um, I'm honestly uh, almost done describing it. And after getting like deep into the nitty gritty of like microscopic features, I can also say like, you know, the cystidia, the chylo and pleuro cystidia are quite different from uh, these other species like Psilocybe tyruga neomaculans and Thai duplicata cystidiata. Um, and yeah, shit. Uh, so that that's kind of how I got to where I'm at now. Um, as far as like acquiring the skill set, to... you were all in at that point. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because um, yeah, that, yeah I, after I did that, I actually I did eventually get the albino chanterelles sequenced uh, by Rachel Sweeney at um, University of Tennessee Knoxville, yeah. Yeah. Um, who works on chanterelles and. So ITS doesn't work on chanterelles most of the time. She used RPB2, I believe. And I mean, it matches Cantharellus coccolobe, the traditional salmon pink 
Uh, though I, I don't know if a matching RPB2 necessarily means it's the same thing or different. So she, I, only, I know, ran, like, she only ran the RPB2. Yeah. Is there um, really no way to do... It has an ITS section, Yeah, so... I thought it was just a matter of the extraction was the issue. I mean, isn't there some fancy dude you can send that to that could figure that out? I don't. So there, there are uh, Chanterelle specific ITS primers. Um, oh, I have no experience okay. using them, and I know th all. All I can say is through Fundus, um, going through all the you know Chanterelles that they tried running like with just regular ITS primers um only one species have i seen work and it was cantharellus californicus oh. and it, it it worked but it required a lot of uh work to create like a consensus sequence because it it had this like repeating thing going on in the beginning and we had to like trim it down and then like make a contig between the forward and reverse and it, it just took a particularly long time i remember to get like a solid consensus ITS read for that. Um, but yeah, I guess RPB2 is kind of the go-to for Cantharellix. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, next best thing, right? Yeah. Well, okay, so that's cool. Uh, finding a, a novel species, never not cool if you like mushrooms. <laughs> if you don't like mushrooms, that means literally nothing, but for for us people, mm -hmm. it's pretty exciting. Now, so so, what are the thoughts here? You know, did did someone from Thailand have a summer home in Miami? Like how? And now, are you consistently still finding these in that spot? Have you found them in more spots? So, the original location that it was collected at was an irrigated mulch bed in front of a security gate in front of a high income gated neighborhood. And for in 2019 and 2020, they were there and then they like redid the mulch and I haven't seen it there since. Ah, okay. But then I found it in another location. And you know, it's there's like a residential mulch bed or it, it was. Yeah, it, it okay. was a residential mulch bed um, about a mile, mile and a half from the original location. And then funny enough, I had someone last year reach out to me and they're like a... I forget what they do. They work on houses and they happen to be working inside that original gated neighborhood and they found some there. Oh. And so then I met up with them and they smuggled me into the neighborhood so I could get pictures and make another collection. Oh. And this was his collection was literally just growing outside someone's front door. So oh. someone in that neighborhood and likely a lot of people in this neighborhood just have this psilocybe growing in their yards. Now, so did you source the landscaper, go talk to the landscaper, find out where he's getting his mulch from? How Columbo have you gotten on this? Because I bet you could figure out they usually get it from one spot. Right. See, I, I've, I've been asked specifically, and I, I feel like I would have to narrow it down to that year. Because in this neighborhood, I've both seen like, uh, trucks pull up with like mulch that just like got dumped, but I've also seen them with uh, bags like okay. the Vagoro black mulch bags from like Home Depot or Lowe's. And I, I mean, I assumed all that stuff it weighs a lot. Like I assumed it would be domestically produced, right? But right, who knows? Well, I mean, I mean on the bags, at least the ones they sell down here, it says it's from Georgia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In my head, I'm just going, okay, so the closest related species is from Thailand. So how my, right. I mean, my first thought is somehow it got over here, colonized, evolved, or, or there's, or this species exists and has not been identified. Well, in so Thailand. another thing with that, so that, I mean, that was based on just ITS and right also based on what was available in GenBank. So those were the closest relatives in GenBank. Now, since then, I've also been able to obtain other sequences from other species that aren't necessarily in GenBank. Um, there's this guy, uh, Alexander Bradshaw, who works in the Denninger lab. 
I don't know if you're familiar with Bryn Dininger. I've heard the, I've heard the name, but I don't know yeah. much about it. So Alexander Bradshaw is currently going to all the herbaria and doing full genome sequences on every psilocybe type. And so he has his own like collection of sequences that he has been uh he's been sharing some of them with me um in order to help with uh nice. the paper for Nivio. So it, it actually turns out there's there's a whole sort of like clade of these psilocybes that come out of India, Thailand, and probably other locations that are all extremely similar in at least ITS. Um, and th there's definitely a lot of like uh, morphological overlap as well. Um, but it also includes uh, psilocybe weyanadensis, which was described from, uh, I forget what it's, I don't, I don't know, the Wayanad district in India. Um, and so I don't know if you saw this post on the Wood Lovers group, but so there's this guy uh, named Anand or Anand from mm -hmm. India. Anand. Yeah. yeah, Anand. And he's been finding all these like wood loving psilocybes and he's been sending them to uh, myself and Julian Matucci. And uh, I I've been able to recently get one of his collections sequenced with ITS, LSU, RPB1, RPB2, and TEF1. And I've been able to compare that data to the data that Alexander Bradshaw has sent me. And at least one of the collections is confirmed psilocybe lanodensis. But it does seem that Anand is collecting like two or three different species. Um, I think one of them is psilocybe subaruganasins, um, which was described from like southern Japan. Um, so th there's a whole clade and all their ITS sequences are extremely similar and you really have to like parse them apart through like comparing uh, macro and micro descriptions. Um, so anyway, I, I don't think this one necessarily came from Thailand. It just happens to be in this clade and, you know, it has a very similar ITS. Um, whether or not it occurs anywhere else, um, who knows? I, yeah, who knows? It's only been found in one county in Florida. I mean, so, so the main reason I say that is because right. you didn't find it in the middle of the woods or in the Everglades or whatever. No, you found no. it in a residential area in, right. in wood chips. That's my main, you know, same with like Alenii, you know, the history on Alenii. You're like, well, it's in wood chips. It's mostly in Berkeley. Do we figure out where this, these wood chips came from? And at a certain point, it dead ends, and you're just like, somehow, some way, a spore had to come from somewhere. Right. And then you go, well, what is it most similar to? What is the closest gen bank match for a domestic species here? Like, And then how far off is it? I'm just out of right. curiosity. Right. Like. Oh, I assumed you knew the answer. To oh, oh, well, um, so a closest domestic match, I believe, is Psilocybe ovoidea cystidiata. As far as how close, based on just ITS, um, I, I don't have that number off the. I mean, it's definitely above ninety five percent, but it's not. But it's way under ninety eight. But it's like between ninety eight and. It, it's probably between ninety five and ninety eight. Um, okay. Yeah, it doesn't even, I mean, it looks similar to it, but it definitely doesn't. Right. Pictures I've seen it, I would not call it. That. Yeah, and it, it has a completely different spore morphology as well. Uh, so, okay. so, like, you don't even have to get it sequenced to know it's okay. not Ovoidea cystidiata. Nice. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's everybody's dream, and that's if you ever needed a reason to go absolutely all the way down the rabbit hole... That's mm -hmm. a cool reason, right? Just an organic something falls in your lap, you follow it through, you figure it out. That's a very cool story. And when I talk to people, there are plenty of people who are roaming through the woods. Um, a thing that I, I learned early on getting into the local scene here is people will have like a bucket list. I, these are the five mushrooms I haven't found yet that I want to find. And I thought that was kind of cool of like, you you know, you read a bunch of mushroom books and you saw a morphology, you saw this fruit and you're like, I love this. I want to find it. But then there are also some people who 
And I, Alan Rockefeller's definitely this guy. He, <laughs> if, if, and I have done this, if I go, Hey, Alan, check this out. And he's seen this 180 times, or I mean, in his case, it could be a thousand times. He doesn't get too excited about that mushroom. If you show him something and he's seen it four times, he's walking right over. Let me take a look at that, right? Rarity is cool. And what's more rare than never seen before, never talked about by any scientist ever. That's very cool, man. That's that's the real citizen scientist right there. That's like, uh, you know, every man bio on YouTube. I don't no. you know this guy. So this guy, he's into more like uh, weirder fungus. He's not necessarily like a mushroom person. He likes, you know, fungus on Petri dishes and whatnot. But yeah, he found like a novel. Uh, he went to the L.A. River Basin. There was some like grasses growing from the the shitty ass water in the L.A. River Basin. And it just kind of looked like something had infected the grass. He took it back, cultured it. And, and there was a fungus that had never been described, was like not remotely like anything else in GenBank. And so he's got this whole channel now where he's just like hunting down and looking for interesting um, fungus for you know whatever uh enzymatic activity they might have novel compounds that they have and all that stuff and it just it's very cool people people love checking it out um so now you're you're working on this paper mm -hmm. um god i thought i had it up here oh maybe we lost it when you want to pull that uh paper back up you just got to upload it again i think we lost it at one point in time when before we started recording yeah okay yeah when, when it kicks you off it, it it drops off now when you go in to present though it should be under slides you should yeah okay i i was able to pull them up um right. so I think yeah should we get into these guys oh whoops wrong one okay here we go no where is it what? oh you're still working on the oh no uh, here it is this is it okay no, this is your, this is my Cena. Yeah. The, oh, you don't the philosophy the, paper hasn't been published. You're still working on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, it, so let's it, move on. Let's keep, let's yeah. get us into some of these, these other papers here. Yeah. So which one you want to do? The, the, you got um, a thing for mushrooms that come from Taiwan. You want to do that one next? <laughs> yeah, we all, could. They're looking for you, Scott. All the Taiwanese, all the lost Taiwanese mushrooms are, are, are hunting yeah. you down. Um, right, so tell us the story before we pull up the paper, just, uh, yeah. How I got to this point. Yep. Yeah. So back in probably October, November of 2022, I came across Kyle Cannon, um, on through Facebook and, you know, he said he was offering like Sanger sequencing, like full, uh, procedure from like sampling to DNA extraction to, you know, sequencing. And, you know, at the time I was sending stuff off to Spain, which costs significantly more money to do. Uh, so I reached out to Kyle and I started sending him stuff, getting sequences back. And, you know, after, after the whole psilocybe and Chant albino chanterelle thing, I was like, well, what, what else is out there? You know, like yeah. what else is novel or like, you know, misunderstood or you know so i started collecting all kinds of mushrooms and then started sending it to kyle and eventually kyle got into nanopore sequencing uh following the protocol of S stephen russell and then i really started sending him a lot of stuff as well as a lot of other people and including yourself yeah. uh who live mostly in the united states and so he you know he's banging out like hundreds of sequences per run and, you know, after the first run or two, we started, you know, trying to highlight interesting finds. Um, and, you know, I don't really recall how it happened, but we also teamed up with um, Joshua Birkbeck. I don't know if you would have met him at NAMA. I know he was there. I don't think I met him, but... Um, the new You're team. familiar. Yeah, so... He got his PhD at University of Tennessee, I believe, Knoxville, and he worked. You mean with... that that crummy Myco school down down there? Yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but.
but he also worked under Joe Amarati in Washington State as well. And okay. yeah, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Joe Amarati. I am he, not, no. He, so he's the one of the Cordinarius guys. Um, I just met a, a woman on Facebook and she's got a channel. I can't even remember her name now, but yeah, I only know one Cortinarius person. Is it Shannon Adams? Still Yeah. Yes, Shannon. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. So anyway, somehow me and Kyle connected with Josh Birkback and, you know, he had all this experience writing papers and publishing and, you know, he has the academic background that right. really complemented the sort of amateur approach we've been taking um so we kind of teamed up with him and started writing some papers and so far we've published two um though we're working on a couple more um so yeah so, we, where where is he out of curiosity what is he actually doing for his day job right now yeah he works in some kind of lab um he got out of academia um i know he just switched jobs and i forget exactly what his title is but some like bio lab okay um, so, yeah. but he had taught for a while didn't like it got went into I, the lab i don't know if he taught it i i don't know i i should uh, probably be more familiar with his background i just I'm know just curious i'm just curious. yeah he works he's... with Matheny and amirati uh, and i met him this summer he's a cool dude knows a couple Matheny, things. Yeah. yeah knows a couple things yeah yeah. He did. He had a presentation on the lesser described uh, species of Appalachia that was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I I hope to see him again at more Namaste. It's a good one. Yeah. So yeah. So this guy, anyway, regardless what he's doing in, in his lab, he's got the the prowess, the background, and so you guys are been banging out some papers. Yeah, and so far we've done two, and they have been published in the journal Macalvania, which is NAMA's Amateur Mycologist's journal. Cool, nice. Yeah. Amazing. Um, um, and so let's pull one up. Let's look at yeah. it real quick here. All right, so let's start with the Mycena from, right. from again, Thailand. Taiwan. Oh, Wait. Taiwan. Oh, my bad. Yeah, okay. yeah. Pretty close, though. Pretty close. The same yeah. South, Southeast Asia. Starts with a T, you know. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, yes. So, yeah, th this one was found in Ohio by Crystal Davidson. Um, and, it, yeah, uh, Kyle sequenced it. It turned out to match uh, both ITS-wise and, like, morphological microscopic features-wise to uh, the holotype of Mycena jinyinga. Um, from Taiwan. So it was a perfect uh, ITS match. Yeah, perfect ITS match. And then, you know, before publishing this paper, we also uh, Josh did the microscopy on it. And morphologically, it's, you know, it fits the description. Spot on. Um, and it was the first time it had been reported in North America, with one exception, which was really interesting. So there was like a short ITS sequence uh, from like Illumina. I, I don't know if you, you're familiar with Illumina. Yeah, they're not cheap. I know that. Right. Yeah. Um, but they do like, sh they usually don't get like the full ITS, like 650 to 700 base pairs. It's usually like 450 to 500 base pair reads. And, they're uh, what and that's because of the limitation of that technology, right? Like something about it's more accurate, but yeah, yeah for whatever reason it's shorter reads right. um i i know less about that sequencing technology than i do sanger and nanopore but anyway so there was one mycena jinging a lumina read from texas from a stool sample that this matched that was the only other record in GenBank of a North American mycena jinging yes why is Illumina sequencing people's poop um like what are they doing is this like <laughs> people that have like major gi issues i mean i know they want to like know what's in there but why are they sequencing it is it when when they find something present I mean, <sighs> how do we get to illumina sequencing your poop i that is crazy i, I mean you know it's funny because the <laughs> that wasn't the first question that came to mind the question that came to mind was why is there mycena jinyinga in a texan's 
How did it get there? That's like my third question, because I know you just have to eat something. But yeah, that's (laughs) that's also interesting. Right. And then like, was it found in Texas? Did this person just get back from Taiwan? Are they serving this? I want to know as an edible mushroom in Taiwan. What did they what is unique about their diet? Are they like uh, diasporic, you know, Taiwanese living in Texas? that is importing a bunch of food from yes those are all the things i'm interested in for sure mm-hmm. i i imagine illumina did not know any of those answers though yeah but we'll know yeah, another cool thing about this paper so jing ying uh the translation means like clear or crystal clear or like crystalline okay it was collected by crystal davidson in ohio and so in this paper, we actually proposed a common name for this mushroom, uh, and it's the crystalline mycena. Um, I love it. Yeah. I she didn't mind that either. No, now, <laughs> not I, at all. I have, I have had the pleasure of hanging out with her at the Ohio Mush Fest. We've gone on a, a, a little foray before. I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't surprise me that she found a little tiny mycena. She is, when you go out with her, she's the first one to plop down in one spot. And to just look extremely carefully in, in one little spot for a while. So that's this is a, a testament to to her foraging prowess yeah. and her approach to it. She's yeah, I'm looking and at actually, a colorful maybe mushroom. Can... She's she's just getting in there. So yeah, let's see. Yeah. Uh we discuss how it was sequenced and da da da. Let's see if I can get to the pictures. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, you can see how small they are. Um, Yeah, really pretty mushroom. Oh, and I mean, it's a nice little flush of it, too. Yeah. And and to have it intact, there's no broken... Well, maybe there was one broken one, but overall, looks... It's a great, yeah, great photo. Yeah. Thank God she found it. (laughs) She she took enough photos of it and took care of it and all that good stuff. Yeah. But, you you know, a mushroom that small, like, it it makes me wonder how, how well distributed they actually are, because I'm sure that's something that would get overlooked extremely easily. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was me. One day I was looking for, uh, I have a little ravine in my backyard, and one of the kids threw a ball back there, and I had to go back to fetch it, and just out of the corner of my eye, one little pine needle just saw these two and i mean they were easily a third the size of this you should have seen me trying to pull it out of the i had to like walk through all this brush and debris in the ravine and i'm like just holding it praying to god i don't lose it so that i can dry it and get it to to kyle and i lost one it it was was like so microscopic so yeah these little mushrooms they just get trampled on. They blow away in the wind mm-hmm. once they desiccate. It's, you know, to actually find it's pretty great. But it does make you wonder then what the real distribution of these are. So we just right. them. We blink. I mean, they, they flush so readily. They don't need hardly any moisture sometimes to flush. So they might be doing this all the times when we think, ah, no, there's no mushrooms out there. And who yeah. knows what's happening. And, you know, another thing I, you know, I can't help but wonder is, so th- this was described from Taiwan, I I want to say it was 2020. I should know this, considering I helped write the paper, but it, it was fairly recent when okay. Mycena Jinging uh, was described. And it makes me wonder, like, how much they really delved into it. Because um, I wouldn't doubt that this has been described in the United States. Like operating under the assumption that it's not like introduced and it's like globally distributed, right? And that it, yeah, has been here a while. Like, I'd find it hard to believe that it wasn't already described here in the United States. I could be wrong, though. I hear you. Yeah, you just, you never know. I mean, it also seems like a long shot to have something. Right. I, I love to go, oh, a couple spores, you know, got put in a box or an envelope and then and you're, you're you know, you fabricate this whole story. But the reality is from from what I've read about spore distribution, of course, we can watch Fantastic Fungi. We can watch all the spores blow off into the wind and you go, sure, it's just going to travel everywhere. <laughs> but it, but I mean, gravity 
right? Gravity's real. And right. when the wind stops, it drops. And the bulk of these spores, they don't get too far. I mean, they're, they're not traveling hundreds of miles for sure. They're probably not even traveling a mile in most cases. So, yeah, the odds of a spore from Taiwan, you know, hitching a ride somewhere seems somewhat low. So, yeah, it, it does probably, I think, odds are it's more likely that it was here. Somewhere. Right. Especially to, like, Ohio. Like, if it were found near, like, Los Angeles or New York City, yeah, yeah that would be right. one thing. Uh but middle of nowhere, Ohio. Like I'm, I'm with you. There's a yeah. lot of middle of nowhere here in Ohio. I will <laughs> yeah. Yes. You, you have the Everglades. We have middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, we have a bunch of cool deciduous trees in a lot of our middle of nowhere. So it's there's a lot of good mushrooms here, man. I'm I am not complaining. Let me. Oh, I, I see them as I'm like going through and analyzing all of yeah, it's Kyle's great. data. I had one, uh, we had one long week of rain and I went on a hike. I was literally walking my dog. I did bring a little collection case with me. Um, one hike for one hour collected 43 species. I mean. Species? Species. 43 wow. fungus species. Mushroom species. That, one. Yeah, one that's hour awesome. Hike. Bonkers. Yeah bonkers i mean it's a pretty interesting little area there's multiple like topography types and all that kind of stuff but yes it was i you're like you take three steps and you'd be like and look at that take another step and look at that and yeah crazy yeah love ohio for mushrooms not complaining one bit i mean of course mm -hmm. there's the pacific northwest and if you like cubes you are right where where you need to be for sure mm -hmm. um, but yeah we got lots of cool mushrooms it's it's been fun all right so this is cool uh who did your slides on this um because there ain't much to work with there so that's looks like good scope work um yeah so josh Birkback did the microscopy on it yeah particularly yeah. e i know those are not the easiest to get the the tissue quality of the lamellae or i forget what they call that but yeah, uh really well, nice. well e is the piliopelis. Okay. And then F, Kyla's Astidia. Yeah. Yeah, looks good. And then yeah. not a lot of spores. Got a few in there. Yeah. On, on well, day. also, when it, when the collection was sent to uh, Josh, a parent, I don't know, I guess they have a machine where they, like, run your shit through it and it, like, flattens it. So I, I, I wasn't aware of this, but uh, that's what they suspect happens. But the whole thing was just, like, crushed. And it was very hard to tell what he was like looking at. Um, you know, it's not like we were writing a full on species description and we, you know, he, he just did a couple features to uh, kind of match up with the yeah, description. It. Yeah. Looks cool to me, man. And then um, you did the phylogenic tree on it. Right. And then we, we highlighted it by um, distribution. So you can see like, Everything in blue is Eastern North America. Um, everything in green is Western. Orange is East Asia, purple, Europe. And you'll see our just like blue outlier in the, yep. uh, yeah. Yep. And then Orange. is it, which one is it the one right above? It's, I can't actually read this because of, cause of the stream yard, but which one was the, the feces? Oh, is that in there? Let me It'd be blue, right? I just can't see it on here. Anyway. Well, it should be in the. Oh, uh, maybe we at. Oh, we we didn't put it in oh, the phylo tree because it was partial. It wasn't enough, right? Yeah, that. Okay, but it would and, it would have been in there anyway. Yeah, but we we did note it in the paper. Cool. Yeah, that that should be in that my Cena Jinging played that nice. is highlighted. Very cool, man. Yeah. All right. Paper number one. Love it. Love that uh, you know, hearing my friends involved in all this stuff. It's 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 very exciting. Who knows next year what Crystal's gonna find for you guys? Something else interesting. Yeah. She will find it. She will find the stuff we well, walk by she, every time. I mean, she's definitely found a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah uh yeah 
if does, we could report on everything that came across yeah kyle's yeah i know We'd, yeah she will turn over every leaf she's also the one she's fine in the cordyceps she's fine in the little stuff she's just the stuff that five of us walked by the same spot she'll find three other mushrooms in it yeah she's pretty she's pretty great she's awesome awesome uh lady to have in our area i'm i'm happy to to have her around she's cool so that's awesome she she uh played a little role in getting your guys's uh paper help people understand distribution of some of these mycena which god if you want a phd in mycology i bet you could have 180 people all start doing mycena and you could probably never run out of stuff to do right they're so little <laughs> i think they're understudied yeah yeah all right so let's let's check out this next paper uh you want to kind of lead us into it how this this one came about yeah um should I just click on it to pull it up? Yeah, or? go. Yep, yeah, go for it. Oh, I got to add it. My bad. Okay, there you go. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So this one was. I found the initial collection back when Kyle was still using Sanger sequencing, and it came back as Cordinarius saniosis. And the only thing I really got out of it was it was the first report of it in florida um and then shortly after this uh i forget who suggested i reach out to him but i got into contact with joe amarati who is the cordonarius guy and he allowed me to send him like any and all cordonarius i find in florida because i guess cordonarius in florida is understudied so I started sending him stuff, and I ended up sending him a second collection of Cordinarius saniosis. Um, and he, he was really excited about it. And uh, basically, the species Cordinarius saniosis, I should know, but it was described from like Norway or Sweden. I forget which country, but basically it's known from like these like boreal montane forests, um, not tropical subtropical <laughs> yeah <laughs> and Florida. so w when when joe got back to me about it he was he actually encouraged me to write a paper on it and you know at that time i it was before me and kyle kind of teamed up with josh and I, I didn't have the uh confidence to pursue that uh i actually i did try and i had like you know a bare bones paper for like months but it wasn't until, um, you know, we got together with Josh and he kind of encouraged us even more. He's like, oh, yeah, you, you know, you've got a Joe Amarati's blessing to do this. And he encouraged it. We should definitely do this. And so we did. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's really cool. And it kind of goes back to like, you know, part of the reason I got into this is like, you know, understanding more about like what mushrooms occur in Florida here, which ones are understudied. And, you know, you have this Cordinarius here, which hasn't been found anywhere near Florida, but is just popping up in tropical South Florida and then subtropical Central Florida. Uh, and then. And so let's... you're finding this one pretty readily. This is not like you found it once or twice or. Well, once once I got it sequenced and knew what it was and got excited about it, I, yeah. And, cause it, it, you know, let me uh, pull up uh, the pictures on it. it. It's not like a super sexy, exciting mushroom as far as like its morphological features. But, you know, it's a, what you'd call a LBM, little brown mushroom, it's basically. Little brown mushroom, yep. yeah. Yeah, you know, most There's people There's a couple of would, those too, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, once I got down to like the identity of it, I started looking for it more and like, you know, I knew what to look for and I've, I've found it quite a lot. So it's just like an undersurveyed species. Right. Um, see, that's and, interesting too. Once you identify, and this is, I talk to people about this a lot. It comes up in the ER all the time because we, 
you know, a lot of people eat the jack-o'-lanterns thinking they're, they're chanterelles. And it's so funny because once you've seen them both, it'd, it'd be nearly impossible to confuse them. E- e- right. Even like a really, like, mature, fully, you know, the, the caps have curled all the way up. Even, even when those jacks are kind of looking like them, I mean, if you've seen them both, you're just never going to get it wrong for the most part. Right. But until you've seen it and you know what it is, you don't know. Or same right. with us, right? Like if this wasn't on your radar before, maybe you walk by it. But then once you're like, no, this is an interesting mushroom. It, you yeah. see it. It's like when you buy a new car, right? And you never, and you bought a new type of car. You're like, okay, now I drive a Toyota Camry. And, and you see that on the road car. all you the see time. Because yeah. <laughs> you're looking for them. It's that yeah. lens. You well, so. It's funny. I, I learned a new kind of word for that recently. Um, I, I this uh, actually a mycology professor who's from Florida. She reached out to me recently and said she wanted a foraging buddy when she came to visit her family. Oh, and cool. so I met up with her. Her name's Amy Honan, uh, and she teaches mycology. And uh, you know, we were talking about this idea of like, even if you don't, you can't like name every like feature you know like you, you don't know the term lamellae or lamellulae or you know incurved or decurved cap margin all that stuff you develop like a vibe of like a certain species oh, yeah. and, you, and you just know but she told me a, a more like uh i don't want to say scientific but like the the term gestalt that's what oh, she yeah gestalt. Yeah. I, I think gestalt. I, yeah i knew it as gestalt but yeah that's like the um It's a psychology term, right? It's seeing the whole thing as it is, sort of. Right. So, yeah, there's you. I don't know. What's another way you could talk about it? Of course, I actually, um, it's one of the weird words that I use a lot, and now I can't come up with an example for it. But, yeah, it's just seeing the sum total of something. Mm -hmm. It's called the gestalt of it. But, yeah, that's really important. And that's why one of, one of the things you guys are doing and, and that is happening on iNaturalist and, and this like mapping biodiversity of different regions is, for example, so I got a bunch of observations when I come in next spring and summer, you know, every week I'm going to be on iNat going, well, what did I find this week last year? I'm I'm going right. to look for those things, right. and I want to see if they're in the same spots. I want to see what they look like. And over the years now, I'm going to be able to pull up and go, we're going to pull up all the Romeria I found in this exact spot over the last 10 years, and I can look at it. Did it show up every year? Did it skip a year every two years? You know, what? what, what is its sort of behavior? Yeah. Did it show up two weeks earlier this year? Right. Yeah. What changed? What was different? But then also, then I'll have assembled more and more and more pictures of this fruit and of course our buddy kyle's going to probably sequence some of it so we're Mm -hmm. you know we're we're going to know more about that i'm very interested to see if some i don't think all species will do this but i'm very interested to see if over the years we keep doing this let's say that you can keep coming back year after year and sequencing this in 10 years do uh you know does a base pair change does it change right. for one year and then go back? The well, actually, year? for this one, this does not match the holotype of Saniosis. It's like two, okay. maybe two base pairs different. But um, where where was the the holotype collected? Uh, I, I mentioned it not, earlier. It was either Florida, right? Oh no, yeah. it was like Norway or Sweden or yeah. something like that. So that um, could be an adaptive, right? Adaptive. And actually, in this paper, we kind of outlined how. Uh, it represents a unique uh, genotype that also uh, kind of lines up with one collection from, I think, northern Tennessee, and then one of Stephen Russell's collection. So that there seems to be a genotype that's kind of divergent from uh, the one that occurs in like Canada and then like Western Europe. But then the Florida one is then another base pair different from the Tennessee and Indiana one. Um, so it seems like we have like a, I don't know if it's a word, but sub genotype of that. Um, yeah, so it's how to me. So you get a lot of these where it's like, okay, so now we got gene sequencing. 
we can barcode this. We can see that this thing that uh, macromorphologically looks the same from Norway to Maine, right? Mm -hmm. But we now know, oh, they're actually, they look identical if you're just looking at them, whether it's under a scope or with your eyeballs. But when you sequence it out, it's a little bit different. Right. So you have that where you have, like you say, it's it's globally distributed, um, in but in similar climates, as opposed to, well, we knew this mushroom grew in this climate, but what the hell is it doing down here? Right. Like that, same with natalensis, uh, Slosby natalensis, right? Um, when these uh, guys, uh, who is it? It wasn't Guzman. Who was the first people? I can't remember. But anyway, they're they're in Africa. They find this mushroom and they go, well, it looks like a cube, but it's a completely different climate that it's growing in. It's it's not humid. It's kind of arid. I forget. There's a name for the climate it came from. But and then it wasn't growing on manure, correct? And, and was not growing on manure. Yes. Just like grass or. I think in a field. Yeah. I actually talked to a guy who lives there who is friends with a, the people who sent or helped the people gain access to these mushrooms the first time it was identified. Okay. And he said, yeah, it's just like a grassy field. Yep. But it's it's a much drier. He said that, and this guy's a, a mycologist there in South Africa. He said the most interesting thing is really just how different the climate is from where right. you typically find these. So, yeah, it's so interesting how where you have all these different criteria, whether you're just looking only at DNA information or you're going, well, climate wise, you know, okay, this climate's radically different from that. Is it the same mushroom? Is it a different mushroom? You got to factor in all these other qualities. How does it look? What do the spores look like? What do all the cystidia look like? To come up with a determination of, should we call this a new species? Should we, is it the same? And we just, you know, is it in the clade? Is it this? Is it that? Right. There's so, taxonomy is, sometimes it's cut and dry, and sometimes it's real sticky. Yeah, and we kind of want to avoid, wanted to avoid jumping the gun and like, prescribing like a, you know, subspecies or variety or whatever with this one. We were, we were like, all right, let's just report on it. If someone who's like a quaternarius head wants to jump in and see if it deserves a variety name, you know, Floridensis or whatever, yep. uh, they but can now, do that. One thing you could do is if you could obtain spores from that the same species from other regions, you could isolate monos. You could you could do you know mono mating tests. You could see what that looks like. That would be an interesting little side project. Of, yeah. Yeah, you could do all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, all these little ways. There's just so much work to do. This has been a theme lately on the show is how much work there is for yeah. stuff. And, you know, all these little tiny projects. That's why we need more people with microscopes. If people are into DNA, we need more people with gel electrophoresis machines. We need more people just doing some of this work, learning. It's, you know, within the grasp of most people if if they're really passionate about it and you're a great example of that you went from just trying to find some mushrooms to eat you know in in florida to you're finding unique mushroom species you're helping to publish work on novel uh you know findings of species this is freaking cool man so it's, it's I, I really admire it i think it's great it's uh I, I want to promote that idea that anybody, if they love mushrooms enough, they can get out and do some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's never been a better time to do it. With guys like Steven and Kyle yeah. running Nanopore, <laughs> virtually no cost. I mean, it, it cracks me up sometimes. Kyle just be like, okay, cool. I need some more flan golf. Hey, here's my, here's my GoFundMe who wants to help support the uh, Ohio mushroom lab. Bam. Then he's got a couple flan golf and he's back up. And yeah. Running. Actually, are you familiar with experiment.com? Uh, I don't think so. 
that's no i i just found uh, a cool one through steven some like protocol site where you can like find up like scientific lab protocols but no what's experiment so that it's basically gofundme but for scientific research and we actually oh, snap yeah the other night uh I was I was on a Zoom with Kyle and I was like, you know what, we just need to do this now. And so I made one. It, it's they actually have to like review it and stuff. Okay. Um, right now, ours is not live, um, but it says it's been reviewed. So I'm hoping in the next like week or two, it's like live and people can start uh, donating to it. So now is um, this an augmentation of Kyle's efforts or is this a new project? Yeah, it, just more of. Kyle's efforts basically this will help fund the next like five or six runs and you know you can yeah set your goal and you can kind of break down like you know how much each thing costs like is you know free agents and primers and Dude, whatever i love it here's why i love this because i grew up in church and every day i'm sitting there on sunday watching everybody put money in this jar and just like what are these guys doing with this money this is just to pay the mortgage on this church like you're not actually doing anything are we going to go out and help some people like are we going to do what jesus did right the whole time i'm just like what is this money going for now you got a way you can tithe to science <laughs> can tithe to science. I love it. I love that, man. I think that's great. And it's really cool that it's themed that way cuz man, the GoFundMe's, you know, it's it can be all over the place. It can be something yeah. worthwhile to wait, you want what are you collecting money for, dear god? I can't believe you had the balls to to post that, but <laughs> cool experiment.com. I'm going to put that on the map. Uh, that's that's, that's going in the description. Yeah. All right. And then as soon as you guys have a live link to that, I can update it so that um, anybody that watches this can do that. Not everybody can wander around the woods looking for right. bathrooms. Uh, some people that it's just like with Patreon, right? Some people go, oh, cool. I can give these guys some money and I'm going to get to see all the cool posts. Like just recently, uh, Stephen Russell's done a string of, you know, unique uh, sequences that have come up, you know, whether it's, uh, you, you know, new, new to GenBank or new to any uh, databases and just seeing those are cool, right? Like making mm -hmm. sure people get to continue this work that, that we learn from and are educated by. It's great. Imagine if everybody just gave a buck, right? You, you could, you could yeah. like $50,000 in a weekend. Right. If if everybody was motivated that way. Right. Yes, that that would be great. That's the dream. Um, awesome. Experiment dot com. Very cool. All right. So you got those two papers. You you got the philosophy paper in the works. You got any other papers in the works? Would you? Yeah. Oh, uh, we have one that we're pretty much done with. I just need to. Uh... Actually, I was working on it right before I hopped on, but uh, I just need to make a couple more figures. Um, basically, it's a summary of runs one through five with Kyle's nanopore runs. Um, oh. Yeah. Just it, like the analytics on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're also going to turn it into kind of like a... The, the title is Introducing the Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab and Contributions from Five Oxford Nano for Analyses. Um, so, yeah, you know, all the methods involved with actually running nanopore, but then we highlighted certain metrics of, um, like, about the individual observations. Like, were they new distribution reports? uh how okay. close as far as like blast searching in GenBank, like how many fell within this criteria of like 97 percent or higher match and then like 99 percent or higher did we okay. create a new provisional code okay so at first i was like so is this just about like the how is nanopore doing but this is more about like how useful is nanopore data seeming to be yeah and just yeah. highlighting like some of the stuff we're finding like how many new pr provisional or temporary codes 
have we produced? How many, you know, species like Cordinaria saniosis have been found in a new area that it wasn't previously known from before? Um, but I think we're also going to have like a personal bio, like introducing Kyle Cannon, Jessica Williams. <laughs> yes. I, th I mean, honestly, that's probably the most useful one you've mentioned yet as far as, you know, cool, finding like a Mycena where you don't expect it or potentially finding a new subgenus or a new subspecies. But right from a scientific perspective, from a what is science going to do with this? It's important to be doing papers that say, look what this guy's doing with nanopore because mm -hmm. not a lot of people are using it. That's great, right. man. That's it. I when you guys get that one done, if you want to do a little little something something on that one, I know we're we're working to get you and Kyle together on one. So hopefully that'll be done by then and we can we can feature that. Yeah, I, I mean honestly, this one will be done in the next like week. Awesome. So well, yeah, I'm just waiting on Kyle, man. Whenever he's got some free time here, I think he's just got like another million uh, species to sequence and, and, <laughs> and we'll get him back on here. Um, that's awesome. Now, I do want to do this. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the local outreach that you do? I know you do a little bit of work um, with, with some local organizations and whatnot. Um, talk yeah, a little bit. I actually, I haven't done too much of that. I only... Back in September, did I do my first like uh, like walk and talk mm -hmm. where I gave a presentation at a local state park. They, they had reached out to me um, through a Facebook group asking about like basically a Florida mushroom man. Uh, and so I ended up doing a talk on like common edible mushrooms in Florida and how to identify them. Uh, so is is, did, is this is this from that? Th yeah, that's from the walk I led afterwards. So okay. I, I did a little slideshow presentation. And wow, then, all these Floridians! They yeah, had to hear you talk about mushrooms. That's awesome. And actually, that first person with the black hat—they're wearing uh, the same hat you're oh, wearing. Oh, check it out! So that's uh, Drew Morehouse. He lives on the west coast of Florida, and he drove three hours across the state awesome. to go to my talk and meet me and. Yeah, he sends stuff to Kyle. Um, and yeah, that was uh, Dude, that's during my talk. House. See, yeah, we had 77 people. So what I'm saying, this is there is this is a, a, a cultural interest in, in fungi and mushrooms right now. It's it's really yeah. true. People are just like, I want to know about this. Yeah. If for no, you know, whether you're in love with cultivating, whether you want to experience psilocybin for yourself whether you like to forage in the woods generally speaking i think what really is going on is this we're in this moment in history where we realize all sorts of things like the history we were taught is not the full history or the full truth there's more about the world we don't know about and i think this interest in mushrooms falls into that right there's just like wait what do mushrooms do they're like they're everything <laughs> if we didn't have them we'd be fucked we'd be living under like 80 miles of debris what that's I, <laughs> it's it's part of an awakening or a, a deepening of our understanding of the world I, I and i see just people continuing to grow in that interest I mean, we know what plants do. We know what animals do. We, I mean, you can pretty much drop out of eighth grade and figure some of that stuff out. But really, people, the average person doesn't understand fungi at all. So here we are yeah. doing all this stuff. It's here we are. <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right. So that is great. You're doing that. Um, yeah. Now, and actually, I, just... I'm going to add a little bit more onto that. So after doing that, and then I did give a second talk uh, the following month in October. At the same place with the same. I, uh, no, actually a different place. This oh, other place heard about my talk at that oh, state park. And they, see? so they reached out to me. Um, nice. It was funny. Actually at the second talk, it was, it was like the night before the Friday before Halloween. And it turned out, just a bunch of like really older people came like 60, 70 plus. Uh, so not the demographic I was expecting, but I had this older woman come up to me after and uh, the, the talk wasn't about psilocybin at all, but she comes up to me and she's like, Hey, 
I grow my own golden tea tree and penis envy at home. And there's, there's nothing better than taking some on a Friday night while listening to Jimmy Buffett. And I, I just thought that was great. I love it, man, dude. I went to Nama. Do you want to know? I, I mean, it wasn't a million people, but a handful of people would just sneak up next to me at one of the talks or whatever, mm -hmm. and just kind of nudge me and go, I really like your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but they were so on the down low, like in mm -hmm. a fair amount of older people. And they like, they, they didn't want everyone else to know that they know, knew who I was, but yeah, there's, you know, that stigma is going away. Yeah. People realize it's not this dangerous thing necessarily. And you know, that it can be an augmentation and uh, I mean, you know, it can be a special event for people. Yeah. Yeah, after after those talks, I uh, I decided to go to my local library, um, and so I inquired about like a like a classroom or something, and they do like rent out a classroom. You can do it like once a month, and so I plan on hopefully starting like a little local mushroom club that I can I hold that. like monthly meetings at, and then like you know have like scheduled walks locally. Man, well, and so Florida, right? I don't, I don't know what it's like where you're at, but where I live, when people are done working and their kids move away and they want to retire, they all want to move to Florida. There's a lot of old people in Florida. Mm -hmm. They got nothing to do. Going on foraging walks, <laughs> learning about mushrooms. That sounds like yeah. a great retirement plan. So yeah, I, I bet you'll, I bet there's a never ending supply of people who will continue to be, I'm sure in two years that club's going to be doing just fine yeah that's cool and you get to hang out with all the elderly ravers and yeah that'd be great man it's very cool uh, um all right so i want to talk about this and and uh you can because this really gets into i think the impetus of my real interest in having you on um i had kyle on one time and he was talking about the bottleneck we, we've talked about what is the bottleneck with this uh Gen this molecular data, this ITS sequencing, DNA barcoding, whatever you want to call it. And what do we do with it? So, right, everybody finds mushrooms, they send them to Kyle or Steven or whoever they're sending them to, a guy in Spain, and and you're getting a, a clump of ACTs and Gs, and it, and it means something eventually maybe it means something right away maybe it means something mm -hmm. down the road but but we have places repositories of this data like genbank or stephen russell's uh michael maps uh, there are more but those are kind of the, the the two i hear about the most um but then once that data is there we have to do something with it and that's kind of what's become your area of expertise that's what you're helping Kyle out with a lot because Kyle's just churning through all the stuff. He's got, you know, a big old whopping pile of reads and then we got to do something with it. So why don't you talk a little bit about right. what you are doing with that information and what a sure, what a robust amount of work that is. Right. Um, so yeah, when, it, when I first, started getting stuff sequenced with like the Psilocity. Um, I would get back these chromatograms and I had to figure out how to interpret them and like just what, what the hell to do with them. Um, Cause you know, it's just this, you know, a bunch of peaks and some letters and it's like, what the hell does this mean? Um, and so over time I, you know, developed the skill to interpret them and like make a consensus out of, you know, the forward and reverse reads. And um, that actually enabled me to get my job with Fundus, where that's essentially what I do is I, I take the sequence data and I make use of it. Um, and so basically, with Nanopore, what happens is, you know, Kyle does his run, and he gets all this sequence data back. And, you know, this part is like above my head, it's like, bioinformatics end where you know it you know uh kind of concatenates it with like all the iNaturalist observations and puts it into one little file and then you can upload that to Stephen Russell's database which is called Mycomap 
And basically what will happen is all the sequences associated with the observations get put together and you can go through and simultaneously open up the iNaturalist observation, which allows you to see, you know, pictures, date, location of the given mushroom. And then MycoMap also automatically blasts the sequence that's associated with it against what's in GenBank, what's in Unite, which is an alternative database for DNA sequences. Um, it blasts against anything that's on iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer, as well as there's a couple like random people who have their own like kind of secret right. barcode databases, like Danny Miller in the Pacific Northwest, where he doesn't typically upload stuff to GenBank, but he has just everything on his computer. Right. And we got him to put it all on MycoMap so we can compare all the Pacific Northwest stuff to his. Um, so, yeah, basically, we're, I look at, you know, what these sequences match um, on all these different databases between GenBank, Unite, iNaturalist, and Mushroom Observer. And it's kind of getting to the point where looking at the GenBank stuff is almost obsolete because there's so much data being produced by Stephen and Kyle and the first thing it does is it gets put to iNaturalist and there's a delay between the sequence being on iNaturalist and then eventually on GenBank. So for the most part, I'm, you know, I'm just going to this like local blast results section that compares it directly against other iNaturalist observations, which is also useful because you can see what the mushroom actually looks like as opposed to GenBank where you know, at best, you'll get like a herbarium number or like a session number, and maybe you can go on Myco Portal and like look at it and see a dried specimen of that mushroom that was sequenced, which ultimately isn't helpful. You're not getting the picture of it in the environment, um, how it's growing, what it looks like fresh. But with things like iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer combined with sequence data, you can do that. Um, Sorry, does that answer your question? Oh, or yeah. Is there something specifically so, so I yeah, should? You're, you, you know, this, I'm just trying to help everybody understand what right. a daunting task this is. Because for the longest time, the issue was sequencing costs a lot of money. So right. There were specimens, or at least theoretically, there could be specimens, but because no one thought they had the money to sequence them all. Like if somebody said, oh, I want to map the biodiversity or the fungal diversity in an entire state and I'm going to get 7,000 or 10,000 specimens, it was cost prohibitive, cost just too much money. But literally because of the nanopore technology, that cost is, you know, pennies on the dollar. And now you guys get to work with these more robust data sets. Now the new bottleneck is going, okay, we've sequenced them all. Now what? So how about this? Walk me through your, your let's say, out of a batch of 100 random sequences. How many of them are relatively easy? Everything goes smoothly. There's a bunch of matches. The matches are off-quality holotypes or isotypes. Um, how many of them are extremely complicated and then like kind of give me like a portrait of what that process looks like at the easiest versus its most complicated and maybe tell a story about something that was really hard to identify, but ultimately like what that process was to identify. Right. Um, well, I mean, I, at one extreme, you have like easiest and, you know, with the Mycena jinging of paper, that observation was a hundred percent match to the holotype. So that means, you Dream know, situation, right. So the original Mycena Jinginga that the description was based off, they sequenced that they made that data publicly available on GenBank. The one Crystal Davidson found in Ohio, the ITS matched it nucleotide for nucleotide, hundred percent match. Great. And then, you know, we also have the INAT observation, so we can see pictures of it, and we know it matches morphologically. And obviously, we with that one, we went deeper. But anyway, 
So that's like one end of the extreme as far as like easy, you know, matches the holotype. And then as far as... How about your biggest win? The one that you're like, oh my God, I'm never going to figure this one out. And then some Hail Mary pass occurred. The right thing happened at the right time. You met the right person. Like, what was the one where you're like, wow, I cannot believe we got to the finish line on this one? (laughs) I'm sure there's been a few, but. Well, actually, I don't know if there's been any like that. Oh, okay. I mean. (sighs) So, okay. So how about then just harder? more work what what's the the next step well so all right what one common uh scenario is like okay so i its doesn't always delineate certain species Uh, so in certain genera or even families like certain species can have like the same its or even like one base pair difference and then like morphologically they can look pretty similar and so even with an its sequence and uh you know your inet observation with presumably decent photos it can still be hard uh to figure out what name to put on it and that could also tie into confusion about whether or not um let's say like one of the names you come across as far as like a close match is a European taxon. So like this mushroom, let's say the Suillus mushroom, for example, was described from Europe and you look into some literature and you kind of ask around and there's a little confusion about whether or not that actually occurs in the U S but the U S collections have been going under that name and yours matches that um now you could just kind of operate off momentum and be like okay well everyone else is putting the same name on this even though it's a european taxon and if you go into genbank and look at the collections or the sequences from europe and they vary by like two percent in its and there are hints that maybe the european one is different from the north american one and the north american one hasn't been described I mean, you have two options. You can either go with the momentum and just call it what everyone else is calling it, or you can give it a provisional name and kind of be the, you know, the stick in the wheel, or I I don't know what analogy to use, but you you could kind of put your foot down and be like, hey, this is actually different. Um, In in a lot of situations, we actually have a, in our little spreadsheet for all these runs, we have a list of experts uh that have iNaturalist accounts so for instance um like rod tolos he's a amanita expert um same with uh there's this uh kid logan burrow she's actually in florida who's also an amanita head and so certain amanitas like that we get stuck on we might tag one of them we also have like a bow lead expert. We have um, Josh Birkbeck. He's a uh, expert on Claveriaceae. So if we get stuck on, so yeah, we have uh, right. a, what do you call it on like who wants to be a note, mean, your phone was, call or whatever. Like your there's a lot of genuses, right? There's yeah, a lot of genera. So yeah, you, you you don't have a list that long. So no, sometimes we don't. you have. So what you're saying is sometimes you have an expert, a known expert that's available that you can consult and get right. some really solid taxonomic advice on. Right. And, you know, some of them are generalists to like a certain region, like Danny Miller, who I mentioned oh. earlier, it, anything in the Pacific Northwest, and we have a question about it, we just tag Danny Miller on INET and go, here, figure this out for us, because uh, there's a little confusion on our end. Right. Um, and, and then so, like... And that's a cool... So I didn't know that. So you you actually tag that expert on the inat observation they get a right. notification so they know they got some work to go do if they right do. so we'll, you know assuming we know that the sequence goes to that observation and there hasn't been like a screw up with like or a mix up or whatever we will import the sequence data into the inat observation so that they can look at it as well and use whatever tools they have and expertise they have to uh that's yeah. cool, man. You're like shelving that data for a while. Now, all of what you're talking about has me, I have not done this yet. 
um, mostly because I'm just sending all this stuff off to Kyle. Um, but uh, my uh, buddy Sarah here in town, who for every mushroom I send Kyle, she's sending them five or six. She is uh, she is a workhorse. She is doing. Yeah, her and Jessica work. send a lot of. I'm I'm kind of sick of looking at their Ohio stuff. They, they yeah. I'm glad she's now. I'm glad they're doing work. They can do their own dang work now at this point. Yeah, they they can validate their own observations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, but but they sort of collect and Sarah's working on a little project here. Hopefully it comes together. I'll definitely have around to talk about it. But um, you know, you get to a point where. If you send Kyle the whole fruit, he has to either then make a decision, okay, I've sequenced this now, do I toss the sample or do I just put this in a just gigantic pile of, you know, a pseudo, very poorly organized uh, fungarium that yeah. I can't even get, I like, you know, then you have this whole cataloging and boxing and filing and it's a whole thing. So there's this other part of all this where there are times where, right, you get down and somebody, one of these experts messages you back and says, boy, it sure be nice to look at some spores under a microscope. Or boy, it'd be nice to look at some cystidia, see what it looks like. Right. If we save these samples somewhere, that's an option then. Have you, do you guys talk about that? I mean, I know basically, I know Kyle and Steven save a lot of stuff. Right. The gals here are saving their stuff. But yeah, I mean, do you guys ever, is that come up as a man long term strategy? Should we be saving this stuff or, or what do you guys? Well, think? so as far as my stuff, I always send part of my collection. So anything with some exceptions, like if I have a single mushroom and it's like, that big and you know oh, mycena acicula i don't know if goes, from, the whole thing goes. the whole thing goes because i can't you it's know it's gonna fall apart that. by the way yeah. it's there half the time yeah um so most everything i send i i keep most of the collection and as, if i get to a point with it where I, i've you know played with it as much as i want to i i've looked at it under a scope um and no further work really needs to be done i send it assuming they don't already have a shitload of the same collection or species rather i'll send it to university of florida for a sessioning in their fungarium um so basically i look what i at what i have i get sequences back i figure out the identity i compare it against what they already have in their fungarium which you can do through mycoportal.com you can just I'm sure there's an Ohio one, like a fungarium in Ohio. You can filter by that. I think and then, Youngstown is the nearest. Yeah, one. yeah. Um, so I'll do that. Yeah. So people, people are really getting into this. Should because I'm in the same boat where I'm like, you know, I'm gonna have to find a way to offload these. I don't have enough space, um, mm -hmm. but I'd love for them to be saved somewhere, especially because from time to time, something I send in is kind of interesting, and maybe it would be good to keep track of it somewhere. So yeah, find your um, local or your nearest fungarium, and I also suspect, uh, and I don't, I don't want to speak for Jessica, but I, I have a suspicion that once Jessica gets her microscope, uh, she'll do more she, of that work. Yeah, and she might open things up for Ohio collections because I, I know she wants to get a lot of these uh, species that have like provisional names in Ohio there's a handful I know she's really interested in. Um, so I, I could see her like kind of yeah, opening things up to people if they have a collection of that species to send it her way for microscopic examination. Um, but also like, I actually used to live in Colorado and so I met people there and I uh, made collections there. And a lot of it I've had through Kyle and so I actually, I'm actually getting together like a box of stuff that I've had sequenced to send to James Chellen. Um, and he's going to study some of it and then eventually get it accessioned into the Denver Botanic Fungarium. I've got someone in North Carolina, Jonathan Horton, who's at University of North Carolina, Asheville. Um, he's going to be accessioning some of my stuff. So just developing relationships with right. uh and then also like these experts, like 
you know, Shannon Adams with Cordenarius. I, I don't know if she's like has an open call for interest in Cordenarius, but um, I know there are some people like that, like Rod Tolos occasionally will reach out to people and ask for a collection of Amanita from them. Um, so if you are aware of people who are studying a certain family or genus, uh, you could keep them in mind and reach out and be like, hey, I've got this interesting right. hygrosity. You study hygrosity. Do you want it? Um, well, and some of these guys are paying attention on INAT too. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll <laughs> randomly get a follow or a comment here and there, and you're like, oh, I know what you're paying attention to. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, they're, they're scouring, right? They're they're hungry. They want to see pictures of their favorite mushrooms. Yes. Yeah. They're, yeah. Anything novel and anything they haven't seen before that that's their cup of tea. And that's, I think that's what makes I not so cool. Yeah. It's sort of, it's like a social, it's on like a social media site for people. Well, to... You know, someone, I think it was Alan was telling me recently, um, that it was originally meant to be that. And the whole like science oh. aspect of it is actually secondary. Wow. Yeah. yeah so it's so basically a social media for nerds. Yeah. Social media for botanists, biologists. Yeah. Mycologists. To be in <laughs> nature. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's how oh, that does make sense when you see how it's structured in its format. It's fascinating too to see ways to see how like Stephen Russell has made INAT work for him and, you know, used, used fields in a way that maybe not everybody originally thought they were going to be used for and all that stuff, you know, and like you said, like the tagging people and messaging people, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a deep rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> um, man, you got me even thinking, so I know Kyle had mentioned to me that he was hoping some of his big collectors, he could get trained so that they could at a minimum, send him a very tiny sample already in like the micro centrifuge tubes that he would use for extractions, or even better yet, everybody doing the extraction amplification process. So when he gets it, he can just run with it. Mm -hmm. It makes me think, man, all these people who have microscopes, if they can learn how to calibrate it, use the software that, that you know, their, their camera comes with, at a minimum, they could take some halfway decent photos, even if they didn't know necessarily what they were doing, sometimes those photos might be somewhat useful. Oh, yeah. yeah. And actually that there are going back to like extreme cases as far as like putting a name on something. There have been a few times, probably less than a handful, where we get like a, you know, 88% or 90% match to the ITS and we you know it's morphologically it's kind of ambiguous and it's like well it could be this genus it could be this genus but you can probably only get it to family and on an even rare occasion to order like agaric ailes actually Stephen just posted one he called it like agaric ailes I, I don't know what state it was from so but let's say ino one whatever um but whoever has that observation, assuming they have part of that collection, to then just simple spore morphology photos, yeah. not even measuring it. Because um, some genera have very like, specific spore morphology, like entolomas. Right. Um, and so in that case, that could actually help uh, push it. you one step down the ladder. To the genus rather than just yep. family or order. And that, right. I mean, what that's doing taxonomically is huge. Even oh, yeah. that one step in that direction is. Because then it's like, okay, let's say it's entoloma or whatever. And most entoloma, you know, they all clay together. But then you have this one in left, out of left field, and it's not matching anything closely, but the spores are right and morphology is right. But genetically, it's like, you know. Yeah, it's useful. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, I know that when somebody's working on a, you know, novel species paper and they're trying to get their micrographs looking real good. You know, they, they can spend a week trying to get everything just perfect, just get the perfect, you know, image of this interesting chylosystidia formation or whatever, but also more simply put anybody with a basic understanding of 
what the just cystidia there are there's basidia there's cystidia can you take a photo that shows off non-spore bearing structures on on the gill you wouldn't even have to be a mycologist you would just have to kind of generally have seen what these images look like and you could probably often enough take a photo that's pretty useful to help identify that structure for yeah them. and actually the the i would i would say if you were to like pick one specific microscopic feature to like target it would probably be the chylocystidia if you can train yourself to just look at the gill edge and just edge. look yes right it takes the best photo anyway or the easiest good photo. right yeah. but on top of that you'll likely also get spore morphology and because oh, right. there'll be spores there so it's like you kind of get to an i mean there's spores all over the place but chylocystidia also tend to differentiate more more than like yeah. pleurocystidia they're also more abundant than pleurocystidia um yeah yeah way harder to make the mount for the for the for the cystidia on the the edge or the side of the gill right structurally more complicated um and yeah, just, I mean, I, I don't know much, but I, it seems like they're, they're unadulterated. They're easy to draw back in the day or, or micrograph now. Um, it just seems like you wouldn't have to do much of a training video that if, if you had people really into this, there could be this intermediate step where they don't have to be identifying and measuring them. But if they just have a calibrated micrograph, there would be instances where that would be pretty useful. Right. And actually on that, um, as far as like the difficulty of like getting like a section cut. Um, so I, I figured something out and it only, only works with mushrooms of a certain like size and to degree density. Um, but you can take like a, a three blade shaving razor. And if you want to do uh, like a Roman aqueduct section that like, cross-section across multiple gills you can oh yeah and it'll produce like three or four cross-section slices at once and they'll be extremely perfect. thin like the perfect thinness yeah no so way. little little tip just gotta pull out that gelat yeah man i've seen all the you know, take the foam peanut and yeah the, no this. no no um, you need so to far, let. <laughs> yes, you do. Now, I have this really thin German razor blade. It's like crazy thin, like thickness of two pieces of paper or something. That, in some instances, is very helpful. The problem is, it's just stabilizing it. So I love that idea of the, the razor is, the middle cuts are probably going to be flawless. Mm -hmm. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot. I mean, I have scoured YouTube for this stuff. I read a bunch of, um, you know, microscopy handbook, this, that, and the other thing. But man, I almost feel like on a, generally speaking, it's a bit of like trade secret. It's like, you know, the Freemasons didn't want to teach people how to mix <laughs> the concrete type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So in, any little, all these little tips this is why I love, I got a little group in the microscopy channel and in my discord and everybody just kind of figures something out and then they immediately share it with everybody. And it's been very helpful to get better mounts and yeah. get better images for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I only figured that out because for the life of me, I could not get like a thin enough section just like with a, you know, I, I tried the, you know, putting it under glass and just. Slight. getting it even too is right like you always end yeah. up with these like weird wedges where a little tiny bit of it's good the right thickness but then part of it's too thin part of it's too thick oh it's a total pain yeah. in the butt yeah wow dude that is amazing i bet you i'm trying to think if there's some other equivalent of that that would be even wider or narrower depending upon what you were doing but that is Dude, well, I mean, you know what it is? They have the they have it where they some of them have the three blades, some have the five blades, some have the mm -hmm. seven blades. I bet that's all a different diameter too. And, and then you can also angle it like against oh, it, so it. you can get yeah. yeah. It's like little miniature, like mushroom planes, like you know, for woodworking, like a plane that like yeah. shaves off. Yeah, it's kind of like that. The only thing is like you. 
a lot of the times like you'll have multiple like kind of stuck in the blades and so i'll just take like a regular razor blade and just like kind of scrape it out yeah 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 i mean you might damage a little bit of it but there'll be plenty in there to you know a a good part of it to play with that's awesome dude i'm gonna absolutely try that (laughs) Uh, I only have one kind of mushroom right now. I, I'm sure I can't. I got mushroom fl- or uh, reishi flushing right now. I'm probably not going to be able to do that with that. But yeah, I'll have to try that with some some of the other stuff I grow. See how that goes. That's cool. And I bet that's a, a good consistency for that too. Yeah. To do that. Wow. Awesome tip. I love it. Cool, man. Well, this, you know, we're going to have you on again. You, you'll you be back on with Kyle and I'm, I'm sure intermittently as the story unfolds and all the stuff you're doing with Fundus, the stuff Steve's doing, the stuff Kyle's doing, the stuff you're doing. It's only going to grow. It's only going to get, you guys are going to get better at it. The, the body of um, the, the community that builds around these efforts is going to grow over time. So, uh, I'm sure this is not going to be the last time we chit chat on the yeah. show, um, <laughs> but thank you so much uh, for coming on. Um, I have absolutely enjoyed literally every interaction that we have when we chit chat on Facebook. Um, I've gotten some cool genetics from you. I am definitely hoping this spring to to play around with the Nivio Tropicalis and see what I can do with it. Um, should Should be a good time. Cool. Thank you. And yeah, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, now that I know you got your little trio of uh, paper, uh, your little paper trio. Well, well, maybe we have to have you three on, and you know, at some point, publish another ten papers, and and we'll just we'll talk about what it's like working with like a, a you know a tight knit group of people that get a process down, and yeah, that'd be cool. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. Can't talk to. Uh, can't wait to talk to you again soon. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right, guys, that was Scott Astuni. Uh, Man, I could have probably talked to Scott for another six hours. I love talking to that guy. He is so knowledgeable. Uh, It is so inspiring to see how, you know, one little trip in the woods, grabbing a mushroom, going, I wonder what this is, can just unfold into something so much bigger and can sort of unlock a passion. Um, I have a young daughter. I got a couple kids. Uh couple daughters and a boy but but the the younger two are still pretty young but my older one she's getting um you know where she's just lightly starting to think about well what am i supposed to do you know like what's my career gonna be all that kind of stuff man i you know you can be 50 and still not know what you're supposed to do with your life but but when you can just have something happen and something feels right um i I, I hope that some of you guys, if you have not already found that, you can find that. Um, I think mushrooms can be that for for some people. Uh, and for sure it was the case for Scott. Anyway, if you guys want to get in contact with him, if you want to know more about what he does, uh, he, we will have him and Kyle on here shortly. Uh, we're going to we're gonna paint a bigger picture of what his project looks like. Um, you know, right here, Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab. Uh, that's Kyle's uh, organization, his nonprofit. You guys can contribute money to to his efforts. He's got to buy flongles for his nanopore. He's you know he's got to buy primers. He he's got to keep the ball rolling. Uh, but but this all will go to building better knowledge of, about mushrooms and where they're at when they're growing, all that good stuff. So anyway, uh, hope hope you guys enjoyed the show. And until next week, go grow some mushrooms. Mm-hmm.